Okay, so in this problem, we have these four streets, which intersect at these, these four points. So I have intersections here, 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 and here. Um, and these streets also only go one way on every different stretch. So on every part uh, outside of the intersection, they can only go one direction, as indicated by these arrows. This goes that way there, that way there, that way there. This one can go this way here and the opposite direction there on different, on different stretches. But the idea is that on each one of these stretches, it seems that they can only go in that one direction. Um, it seems also that the cars are allowed to, to change direction at the intersections. So if a car comes in here, it could go that way, right? And then it could go this way st straight through, but it's not, it's not allowed to go that way because then it would, it would be going against that arrow. Um, and, and we also know some stuff about how many cars come in in any particular direction. So hundred come in there and 250 come out there, uh, for example. And, uh, with with this information given, we want to figure out, you know, can we determine with certainty how many cars are passing through this point or this point or this point or this point? Um, and the first thing, the first thing that I've done here is is label those points, assign variables to them, call them x1, x2, x3, x4, and that represents the number of cars passing through those points. Um, and then we're going to try to set up a system of equations. Taking this information that we have about them, we're going to try to translate this into a system of equations, which we're then going to put into a matrix and row reduce and see if we can interpret the results to figure out uh, whether we can, we can determine how many cars go through this intersection uh, or go through those points. Um, okay, so, so the key to coming up with these equations is looking at the information that we're given. In particular, in particular the, um, the outputs are the key. So every output is going to give me every number uh, outflow of cars from an intersection is going to give me an equation. So here I know that 250 cars come out from that intersection, that, that point there, and I know that how many go in? Well, 100 come in from here, x2 come in from there, and x3 come in from there. So that means that this is my first equation, 250 is equal to 100 plus x2 plus x3. So that's, that's great. I get one equation here. Um, what, uh, what else do I get? Well, there are two more outflows. So there is, there is this outflow 320 coming out here from this intersection, right? 300 go in here, uh, X four cars come in from here, but out of, out of these, this 300 and X four X one sort of go off in that direction. They don't come out. That means that the 320 is equal to that 300 plus the X four minus the X one cars that, that go out the other way. So so I end up with this equation, 320 is equal to 300 plus x4 minus x1. And then the last equation that I get is um, over here, 400 come out. How many went in? 300 plus x1 uh, minus x2, right? Out of those 400, the, well, there were x1 coming in from the, that way, and then 300 coming in from the other way, and x2 gets siphoned off. So, so I get 400 being equal to x1 plus 300 minus x2. And so those are my three equations. Um, but you'll notice we have four variables, x1, x2, x3, x4, and only three equations. So that means we're going to have infinitely many solutions, right? There isn't going to be a unique solution to this system of equations because I have more degrees of freedom than I have restrictions. Each equation is a restriction on the relationship between the variables. And each variable, because it, it's, it can change, it's a variable, um, is, is a degree of freedom. Since there's more freedom, more degrees of freedom than there are restrictions, more things than I can change than conditions I have to satisfy, I'm going to get uh, infinitely many solutions. So, uh, but how do we find these? It's going to be a mess if we try to do it by hand, so to speak. What we're going to do is, is by hand, but using, using a matrix to, to help. Um, and so, so I, bring this, I bring these equations down here, and then I put them into this form. I get them into matrix form. The first thing that I do is I get all the all the constants over onto one side. So I subtract, I subtract the three hundred from the four hundred, the one hundred from the two fifty, the three hundred from the three twenty, etc. And then I I uh, the next step is I arrange the variables. Uh, so I put I put the x ones all in a row here, and then I put the or in a column rather. I put the x twos all in a column, and then I put the x threes all in a column, and then I put the let's make it uh, purple the x4s all in a column, I kind of stack them. And notice I'm putting in the zeros. So the first one has no x3s or x4s, but I actually write those in. Second one has no x1s or x4s, I write those in. Third one has no x2s or x x3s, but I write those in nonetheless. Why? So that then I can fill in this coefficient matrix. I take the x1 coefficients and put them here. 
but then I take the x2 coefficients and put them there. I take the, this is the orange, the x3 coefficients and put them there. x4 coefficients go here, and then all the constants go in this column, and I put the slash 2 to divide the constants uh, from the, the coefficients. And then I just do some row reduction. This, this might look a bit scary because, because we have these large numbers, 100, 150 uh, over here, but, but actually the things that are, that are important, right, the coefficients are all ones and negative ones and zeros. So this is gonna be pretty, pretty simple to do. Um, so I just do the, the basic row operations, right? This one is, what is this? This is row three plus row one, right? I wanna kill off this negative one first, and then I end up with this thing, and I wanna get rid of this negative one, so I do row three plus row two, and I keep I keep doing stuff like that, making sure that I, I add the entire rows, not just the entries that I'm looking at, and I and I'm careful with the arithmetic in the columns there, um, and and paying attention, of course, to the to the coefficients, and then we end up with this this uh, reduced matrix. So I know I know that I'm going to stop because or that I can't stop because I get uh, the leading ones right straight down the diagonal here, and then I only have zeros below them. It's only zeros there. Um, to below and to the left of a leading one. That's great. I could I could go I could go and use this one to get rid of these things and and do some other stuff. This is not this is not reduced row echelon form. This is row echelon form. Reduced row echelon form is if I also had zeros above all the all the leading ones. Um, but it's all it's not always necessary, and, and that's really nice because it, it, it especially if you get a unique solution, you can just read it off from here. Um, but that's actually not not so necessary, especially when you don't have a unique solution, as we won't here. Um, the the row echelon form is often just as useful. Actually, actually leave that to emphasize the, the zeros. Why? Because I can look at each I can look at each uh, row and get an equation. The first row, because this is, keep in mind, this is the x1 column, the x2 column, the x3 column, the x4 column. Um, the first row gives me the equation x1 plus x3 is equal to 250. The second one gives me x2 plus x3 is 150. And then the third one gives me x3 plus x4 is 270. Assuming, of course, that I made no computational errors. That's a bit of an assumption, but... Um, uh, assuming no no little little arithmetic mistakes, these would be correct. Um, now, if I wanted if I wanted to to solve right, if I wanted to, um, especially if I, again I had a unique solution, I could go and back substitute right. I could take this one and solve for x x three say x three. That's a horrible three. X three is to seventy minus x four, and then substitute that in here for the x three, and substitute that in here for the x four. Right, and I could, uh, or I could get it into reduced row echelon form if I, if these were like um, I was trying to find the intersection of planes, I could get the vector equation of the planes this way. Here, I'm not so concerned with this. Right here, I just wanted to, to figure out whether I can get whether I can get the um, uh, a unique solution, which is the first question. It's it's clear that I can't. Um, this this matrix has a rank a rank of three. Right, it has three leading ones, so the rank is three. It has four columns, right? So it does not have full rank. Um, the rank, the number of leading ones or pivots, is less than the number of rows. So, so it, it it's not going to have a unique solution. It has infinitely many solutions, right? It has it has a parameter. The number this is the the all important rank nullity theorem. The number of parameters one is equal to the number of columns for minus the the minus the rank. The number of leading ones, which is three. So I have a parameter, a degree of freedom, which means that I'll have those infinitely many solutions. Um, so, so I, uh, I get these three equations and now I can use these to figure out, to, to learn something about it, right? I know I can't get a unique solution, but I can, I can get some information. I get these three equations and these are going to allow me to, to figure out stuff like what is the maximum uh, and minimum possible values of these things. So, so, and I can, I can just sort of think about this, right? I can just look at this and say, okay, what about like X2? What, what is the minimum value of X2? Well, from this equation, the only one x2 appears in, it's clear that it, it, the most it can be is 150, right? It, it can't be more than 150. If it's more than 150, then x3 has to be negative, and we can't have a negative amount of cars going through, right? Um, what about, what about uh, x1? x1, we can tell from the first equation, it has to be less than or equal to 250, um, uh, again, because x3 can't be negative. But we have there. There is something we have to check. We can't be quite so hasty. 
if if those if that were true, right? If x two was one fifty or x one was two fifty, x three would have to be zero. And would that make sense? Well, yeah, actually that'd be fine. We could just say x four is two hundred seventy. That compensates. That's fine. We couldn't do something like say make x four equal to zero, right? Because then x three would have to be two seventy. And from this equation here, we can see x three can't be uh, more than one hundred and fifty. Right, x3 similarly, x3 similarly has to be less than or equal to uh, 150, which means that we have actually a lower bound on x4, right? We have to have 120 is less than or equal to x4, which is less than or equal to 270. Um, so stuff like this allows us, we can just reason our way through and figure out the, the upper and lower bounds on all of these. Of course, if we want, if we want a... Um, a particular solution to this, right? If we want to say, figure out, um, you know, uh, uh, like one particular set of, uh, of numbers, x1, x2, x3, x4, which satisfy this, well, I can, I can just sort of cheat and look at the, the x3s and say, okay, x3 is the one that appears in all of them. What if I just set x3 equal to zero, right? I can say x3 is equal to zero, and this determines all the rest of them. x1 is 250, x2 is one. 50 x4 is 270. Um, and similarly, um, I, and, and this is again, this is the, the whole idea, right? With, with uh, it having a parameter, right? x3 would be the parameter variable. I can, I can make x3 whatever I want. x3 is free, right? Because I can, I can just determine within, within these bounds, of course, right? What is, what is my x3 going to be? And then it just adjust the rest of them to, to um, compensate for that. So figure out um, what what uh, is going to make what what x one x two x four have to be to make the rest of these equations work? So that's how I get a particular one. And like I say, to get to get the bounds on the rest of them, and this is this is um, just a matter of going through case by case and thinking. You know, the, it's clear what is the biggest it could be. What's the smallest it could be? Could it be? Could it be zero? Could it be this? Without causing a contradiction um, with the rest of them, uh, you can you can get lower bounds on on all uh, all four of the variables as well. Um, and it, it won't necessarily be zero, as we saw with this, with this case of, of x four here it has to be at least one hundred and twenty.